Amen. If you'll kindly remain standing to honor the word of God that today comes from John chapter 16. I'll begin at verse 5. But now I am going to him who sent me, yet none of you ask me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your hearts. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment, about sin because they do not believe in me, about righteousness because I'm going to the Father and you will see me no longer, about judgment because the ruler of this world has been condemned. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth, for he will not speak on his own, but will speak whatever he hears, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the father has is mine. For this reason, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Let us pray. Oh Lord, uh, we know that your spirit is present here with us because you promised to be when we gather, with us when we gather. And we know that you're a spirit that speaks truth. And these words that were just read are your truth. And we ask now that you'd be our teacher, that you'd illumine our hearts and minds to thrill to your word. Amen. In the quiet of the upper room, as the weight of impending events hung heavily in the air, Jesus sensed the anxiety of his followers, his friends, his disciples. They had journeyed with him. They had heard his teaching. They had seen miracles happen. Um, but now their hearts were troubled because Jesus has told them he's going to go away. Um, and so he spoke to them and his voice was calm. It was reassuring. In that setting, he reassured them by letting them know that God would be sending them a helper, uh, namely the Holy Spirit. We are this summer doing a series of sermons looking at the person of the Holy Spirit. And today we're going to continue by looking at a different angle. We're going to be looking at all different sides of this this summer. And John is going to give us through this text uh, some wonderful insight into who this Holy Spirit is. So I want to ask three questions of this text. Uh, who is the Holy Spirit? What does the Holy Spirit do? And what does the Holy Spirit say? So three questions that we're going to look at. Um, first question, who is the Holy Spirit? Verse seven, nevertheless, I tell you the truth, Jesus said, it is to your advantage that I uh, go away. For if I do not go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. John refers to the Holy Spirit as the advocate. Now, it's this wonderful Greek word, to, the word paraclete is the word for advocate or Holy Spirit here, paraclete. It comes from the Greek verb parakaleo, which is actually two Greek words that are combined. Para means to stand next to, to come near, to move alongside. Kaleo means to call or cry out. So parakaleo, the verb, and paraclete, the noun, both refer to someone who comes alongside, someone who stands next to us, someone who stands near us and calls out, speaks. It's almost impossible to come up with a good English, uh, a full English word uh, to translate this. We really don't have an English word that is adequate. So you see this in Bible translations. This word is translated in various ways. In the Old King James Version, it is translated as the comforter, in the New International Version, it's translated as the counselor. Uh, some translations even say the friend or the helper. In the Revised Standard Version I've been reading, it, it's, it's the word the advocate, which I think is maybe the best word, but we actually need all these words in, to employ all of them to get a full sense of the role of the Holy Spirit. You know, all of the best relationships in our life are when we are alongside each other. Relationships work best in a marriage when each person is alongside each other. 
With our youth leaders, we strive to be on the same level, alongside, journey with our students, to enter into their world and listen to them. Uh, with our own children, what do we do? We, grandchildren, we get down on their level and speak to them. Jesus sends the Holy Spirit, the Father sends the Holy Spirit to come alongside of us on our level to comfort, <clears throat> to encourage, to correct, and to point us to Christ. This past week, I uh, had the opportunity to, to go with our middle school students over to Forest Home Camp over in California. And I wasn't there the whole time, but I got to visit them a few times and see them in action. And uh, it, it was absolutely wonderful. And I got, one day I went was the day they were having the pool competition all around the pool, water games. Well, as you know, you all know this, the, high, uh, the biggest competition in the pool games, the most important, is of course, you know this, right? The belly flop competition. This is the number one thing. This is really important. So I was there, and so our um, person that we put forward, our student that we put forward for this, for this competition was Levi Begaman, member of our church. And so, you know, this is kind of building up to the end of the competition. So I went up to Levi, and I put my arms on his shoulders. I got down into his ear, on his level, and I said, Levi, I need you to listen to me. Hear me close. What do you see standing around this pool, Levi? And he said, well, those are other churches. And I said, that's correct. Do you represent those churches, Levi? <laughs> he said, no, no, I don't. I said, who do you represent, Levi? He said, Mountain View. I said, that's right, Mountain View. I said, Levi, we're all counting on you. Levi, I don't want to lose to any of these other churches. I need you to sell out. I need you to sacrifice. You can do this, Levi. I built him up and built him up. You are the person that we have chosen. You have experience in this, Levi. You can do this. You are the one. You are great. You are strong. Don't let us down, I said. Well, I have photographic evidence of this. Here's Levi right there. <laughs> Right? And sure enough, first place he won. <laughs> I think I deserve a lot of the credit for this. I really, really, you know, built him up. Um, yeah, it was absolutely wonderful. Um, Levi was uh, great. And afterward, everyone's cheering. We, you know, we, we told him his parents were in the contemporary service. They're very proud, as you can imagine. <laughs> Um, now, it, wouldn't it be wonderful to have an advocate like that? I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful to have an advocate come alongside and say, you've got this. You're strong. You're amazing. You are fantastic. Today, you can do anything you want because of who you are. You're strong. Fortunately, that's not what the Holy Spirit does. <laughs> It'd be nice, and sometimes we might tend to think, boy, wouldn't it be great to have God just tell us great things about ourselves and how wonderful we are, that we're strong and courageous and brave. That's not what the Holy Spirit does. He does come alongside of us, and he does tell us important things and good things, and at the end of the day, we are given courage and strength in all these things. But he does it in a way that we might not expect. He's our advocate. And if, what we really need is not to feel good about ourselves. So what the Holy Spirit does is help us feel good about God. The Holy Spirit says, look at Jesus. Look at how strong he is. Look at how good he is. Remember what he's done. Remember, remember. And the Spirit keeps speaking and whispering into our ear. Look at who Jesus is. Which leads us to the next, and that is, what does the Holy Spirit do? And we read that in verse 8. What does the Holy Spirit do? And, and when he comes, he will prove the world wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because they don't believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father and you'll see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world has been condemned. Here's, here's a really interesting thing. The Holy Spirit is there to tell us that we are wrong, to prove us wrong. 
Uh, another place, it says to convict us of our sin. Are you with me? Prove us wrong. Convict us of sin. Now, what does it mean if you had a friend come into your life and they had those two rules, roles? To constantly tell you you're wrong and to convict you of your sin. How would you feel about that friend? Not very good. Now, prove us wrong. Convict us of our sin. And at the same time, the Holy Spirit's there to remove guilt. All right, pastor, you're not making any sense. How can this be? This sounds so strange. How can you have someone telling you you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong, and at the same time, they're to remove guilt and shame? How does this work? Well, this is, we're going to have to kind of peer in a little bit close here um, and see what's happening. Tim Keller points out that there's really two kinds of advocates um, at work here. One we might call a, a sober companion, okay, a sober companion. A sober companion comes along and says, well, of course, yes, you have this terrible addiction. Um, and by the way, you're wrong in thinking you can manage it. You can't, that's why you need me. A sober companion walks alongside and makes no bones about it. Like, we can't fool around with this thing. Um, and you need me, and we're going to have to do this, and we're going to have to live this way, and this is how it works. Um, it's, it's sin addiction. And it, a sober companion will certainly be encouraging, certainly giving words of encouragement and help. Like, hey, today, let's start anew. Let's pick it up, let's do. I mean, that's a, that's a great role of a sober companion. But what a sober companion won't do is tell you every day, now listen, let's go over, let's start the day and rehearse all the terrible things this addiction has done to your life and others. I want you to feel bad every step today. I want you to realize what you've done and feel shame and remorse and guilt. No, that's not, that's not helpful. That doesn't help someone who's trying to take a step in the right direction each day. You know, we all get addicted to sin. It's an addiction and we need help. And there's a couple of grave temptations in this journey. Um, one is to become underconfident. I'm a horrible person. Yesterday I said I wasn't gonna do that and today I didn't even make it till noon. I mean, I, I keep doing the same thing. I feel horrible. I feel guilty. I, I, I tell myself, I can, I can manage this. I'm not going to sin. Uh, it's just not going to be. And so we're beating ourselves down by the relentless, and we're just underconfident. I will never, ever be able to conquer this, so why even try? I'm a horrible person. And our hearts get weighed down. The Spirit speaks to us in those moments and says, that's not an appropriate place to be. You can follow, you can do this. You are loved by the Father. With you, he is well pleased. You are a child, you're a child of the king. You're a prince, you're a princess of the king. And other times we become overconfident. Yeah, I'm okay with this addiction. It's, I, I just have a little addiction. It's not like the big ones. You know, I, I can manage this. I'm doing just fine. I don't have the big sins like the people over there. <laughs> right? I mean, mine are small. Yeah, I, maybe, I, maybe I tend to do it each day, but mine are little, you know, I, they're tiny little ones. And um, boy, that's when the Spirit needs to speak to us as well. Spirit looks into our hearts and says, why are you doing this? Sex, money, power. You keep grabbing at these things and pulling them in to try and fill some emptiness in your life. And it never delivers. It never delivers. It never works. And when you do it, you're pushing God aside. The one that says you're the beloved. Don't be overconfident. You can't mess around with these things over here. They're empty. They'll lead you to ruin. So this companion comes alongside to encourage us, correct us, nudge us, all for our benefit, to speak truth in a wonderful, wonderful way that an advocate can do. So one 
image is a sober companion, but the other image we find in, in scripture for an advocate is a defense attorney, legal. We see this come up in scripture. Now, earlier in John, Jesus had said, referred to himself as an advocate. And he said, I will send you another advocate. Now, this is the best news you're going to hear all day. We have two advocates. Jesus and the Holy Spirit are both of our advocates. Jesus is our advocate for the Father. He refers to himself this way. In 1 John, 1 John, John explains, but if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. In Romans 8, God the Father sits on the judgment seat. Jesus intercedes for us. And so the Spirit, the Holy Spirit says, look at him. Look at your defense attorney. Look how he's interceding for you. He's up there doing it right now. He's making an argument. He's making a case. Um, this is what we read over and over again. Charles Hodge was a great theologian at Princeton Seminary back in the um, 1800s, 1840s, longtime professor, gifted theologian. Bruce and I had classes in Hodge Hall back in the day. Um, he points out that our defense attorney, Jesus, has an infallible case. He's got a great case to make. He argues not from mercy, but from justice. So imagine the defense attorney in front of the judgment, the, the, the final judgment, and our attorney goes forward to make a case. I tend to think that his argument in that courtroom would be, uh, my client over here, yeah, I, 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 we all know he's done a lot of wrong things. He's done a lot of wrong things. And then the scroll would roll out and, and, and they would start reading the scroll and it would get longer and longer and longer and the scroll would go out. And this defense attorney would say, I understand that he has a long you know, rap sheet. He's done a whole lot wrong in his life, but please, please, please have mercy. I'm begging you, begging the court, have mercy on my client. I tend to think that's the way it would go down. How would I feel in that situation? Terrible. I would feel horrible. I would feel guilty. I would feel a mess. But remember what I said? The Spirit's job is to remove guilt. So how does this work? Jesus is not arguing for mercy. His argument is based upon justice. And what his argument is is, he shouldn't be on trial. Why? The penalty's already been paid. It's already been taken care of. He shouldn't even be here. Isn't that amazing? Do you see how that works? He just, I don't have to live with guilt and shame. You don't either. The Spirit's wanting to tell you, do you understand what he's doing? He's interceding right now for us. He's taken the full weight of the decision, the penalty on himself. And so what Hodge says, he says, he's the only mediator we could ever have. He's the only advocate. The Spirit says, look at Jesus. He's mediating for you. There's none other authorized or qualified to act on our behalf, not ourselves, not anyone else. Number two, he says, his intercession is perpetual. He keeps doing it over and over again. Number three, it's always successful. He wins every case for those who are in Christ, for those who are Christians. Number four, it's freely offered, freely rendered. For those who believe in Christ, we're given all of this. It's amazing. And then Hodge says, there's three things that you and I ought to do in response to this. Commit our case to his hands. <laughs> Trust him. Don't make an argument. Don't be overconfident. Don't be underconfident. Trust him him. Give him the case. Let him do all the talking. Number two, live your life in trust and in confidence. Hold your head up. Number three, he says, if we know this, if we hear the Spirit saying this to us, our lives ought to be marked by gratitude and love every day. We have two advocates. 
One is working on our behalf, making the case. The other is saying, look at him. Look at what he's doing. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And then finally, what does the Holy Spirit say? Uh, Verse 13, when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me because he will take what is mine and declare it to you. The spirit does not speak on his own. The spirit speaks to us what he knows and what the spirit knows is God's word, God's truth. In Hebrews chapter four, it says, the Bible is the word of God alive and it acts like a two-edged sword that penetrates. The Holy Spirit speaks the Bible into our lives, illuminates God's word and God's truth. And it's wonderful. And if we're listening to it, it gets rid of doubts. It gets rid of the hubris. It gets rid of the hardness that we all have in our hearts. The Spirit speaks the words of Scripture. And that's why it's so important to memorize Bible verses, to read them over and over again, because the Spirit's wanting to say, listen to this. Put this into your heart. Plant this promise. Let it germinate there. And in so doing, it'll bring us help. It'll bring us comfort and correction. Years ago, when our children were little, we had an incident in our family where um, there was a person in authority, a professional person, and um, he did a a harm to our family. And um, I I was so upset by this. The details are not important, um, but I have to tell you that my reaction to what he did was to be so angry. I was furious and upset. It happened in the morning, and that afternoon I was just stewing, getting more angry, and all I could think about was I need to harm this person for what they did. So I called an advocate, an attorney, who is a friend of ours, our family. And I called him late that afternoon, and I told him the story, and he was familiar to this particular field. And I explained everything to him. I told him how angry I was. I said, I I want justice here and I want to hit him back and I want it to be done. I want a lawsuit and I want you, we're gonna do this and this and this and this. And he listened to all of my venting. And I'll never forget this. He was very calm. He's a believer in Jesus, this attorney. And he said, Steve, I understand the way you feel and I'd be angry too. He said, and oh, by the way, if you decide to do this, I will help you as an attorney. Um, and you'll win your case and you'll win big. You'll win really big. No doubt about it. And then there's a long pause and then, then I will never forget what he said to me. He said, however, I want you tonight to pray and to ask yourself, is this what Jesus would do? And that floored me absolutely floored me. And that night I did, and I prayed and I listened. And these words came into my heart. It's from Romans 12. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. That's not for you to do. And at that moment, I was convinced that the Holy Spirit was correcting me and comforting me by bringing a Bible verse into my heart. I'd been studying this passage. I knew it. But the Spirit says, are you listening to what I'm saying? Are you listening to it? This is what Paul said, don't hit back. It's what Jesus said. I understand there are times for lawsuits. (laughs) And I understand there are a need for attorneys in our world. I get it. I'm not speaking to that. But at that moment, my heart needed healing. I needed to be reset. 
recalibrated. I need to see what was happening. I needed to have a word of truth that said, you may be feeling so angry right now, but what happened may not be as bad, as big as you thought it was. And the spirit was true and right. And looking back now, I'm embarrassed that I was so upset, even though what what happened to us was wrong. This past week, our students memorized Bible verses at Forest Home. What a good thing to do. I wonder if years from now, when they hit a point in life where they are really low, maybe a depth of place where they're hurting and, and feeling alone, maybe the verse that they memorized might come by the power of the Spirit back into their hearts. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived of what God has in store for those who love him. Wouldn't that be great? I wonder if they're at a place where things are not working out and they seem to be this and this and this didn't work out and this job didn't work out and I didn't graduate with this. If that verse they memorized would come flooding into their hearts, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. That's what the Spirit has to say. It's what I need to hear. It's what you need to hear. Maybe today we listen carefully to that voice. Maybe today we push aside the competing voices. Listen to the companion, the advocate, the helper, the friend. What might he be wanting to say to you today? Let us pray. What joy is found Uh, in your son, Jesus Christ, O Lord. And then what help comes through the voice of your Holy Spirit points to us and reminds us that you are our heavenly father, that we are called your children, your beloved children. So help us to trust and to love and to be full of gratitude this week. We humbly ask in Jesus' name, amen.